computer. Great. So in the previous week, we were discussing some properties of Fourier transform for discrete time signals. Uh, that was on Wednesday. So I just wanted to remind you what all things we have done so far. So this is the synthesis equation for discrete time signal. Uh, so you start with the Fourier transform, you take this integration, and then you get the original signal X of N back. X of N can be any aperiodic signal. And if you want to compute the Fourier transform, then you just have to take this infinite sum and Based on this infinite sum, you will get the uh, Fourier transform for the signal, aperiodic signal, and this is denoted by this notation. So X of N with double arrow with FT on top, X of E raised to J omega. That's the Fourier transform notation, okay? We looked at several properties of Fourier transform. Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, so periodicity, linearity. So if you take linear, combination of two signals, then the Fourier transform is also the linear combination of the two Fourier transform. We talked about time shifting. So if X of N minus N naught, if you want to take the Fourier transform, you will have some E raised to minus J omega N naught multiplied by the Fourier transform. So we talked about time shifting, frequency shifting, conjugation, uh, difference, uh, equation and accumulation. And then we talked about time reversal. So these were the different properties we had talked about in the context of Fourier transform for discrete time aperiodic signal. Today, we are going to continue our discussion on the same topic, and we'll talk about some other properties of Fourier transform, including the convolution property and the multiplication property of Fourier transform. So the first property I want to talk about is time expansion. Okay, so in time expansion, um, so I have my Xn and the Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. Now, I'm going to define a time expanded version of this. So XK of N and this is defined as follows. XN over K if N is a multiple of K and zero if n is not a multiple of k. Oh, I have to remind you that here n and k, both of them are, sorry. So n is a integer, whereas k is a natural number. So it's a positive integer. K is a positive integer, whereas N is any integer. It could take positive and negative values. Okay, so this is the time expanded version. So why is it a time expansion? Let's uh, look at an example to make it concrete. Here is the N and let's say I have That's it, this is my signal X of N. 0 minus 1 plus 1. That's it. The other points are all 0.
Okay, let's look at n. I'm going to pick k equals to three and let me mark zero, one, two, three, four, five, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus five. So k equals to three. Okay, so at zero, what is my xk of k of zero? It will be equal to x of zero because zero is a multiple of three. So in this case, it will be this small line. Now, what about xk one? Is one a multiple of three? No. No, right? So xk1 should be equal to zero. So I'll have zero here. Same thing, xk2, two is not a multiple of three. So that will be zero. Now, what about xk3 so is 3 a multiple of 3 yes so therefore xk3 as according to this equation it should be x of 3 over 3 which is x of 1 and so at 3 you will have a x of 1 and it's going to be the same story for negative one, negative two. At negative three, I'll have this long line. And then at four and five, I'll have zero. Okay, so this is a time expansion. We are expanding the signal. We are stretching the signal across time. However, in the process, we are introducing some zero signal. So we're not losing information in this process, but we are including adding some more information, which is I'm going to add zero, zero in between the stretched signal. Okay, so this is why it's called time expansion. You're expanding the signal, you are stretching the time axis and introducing some zero signals in between. Okay, now the question. What, what's it? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. What's an instance where this could be used like in the real right. world? Yeah, yeah. So let's say you have two processes and they are going on at different time scales. So let me give you an example. Uh, suppose you are pressing the accelerator in your car and uh, the sampling for the accelerator happens every 100 millisecond. But on the other hand, your engine has to fire the, like it has to run at every 10 milliseconds. So the fuel needs to be injected and the fuel needs to be burned and the engine has to run every 10 milliseconds. So now you have two processes, the accelerator, which is working every 100 milliseconds, you are sampling at every 100 millisecond and you have this uh, uh, engine where you have to send commands every 10 milliseconds. So how do you, how do you reconcile these two processes in your computer where you are basically deciding when to fire and when not to fire the cylinder? So in those cases, you have to stretch the time. So in one of the signals have to be upsampled or downsampled for it to work smoothly. So that's where you sort of stretch time um, so that you can uh, make sure that all the signals have the same time scale and uh, that's where this sort of information, uh, this sort of stretching the time is needed. Does that make sense? You have to have processes with different time scales in your system. Yep, that makes sense, it's, thanks. It's pretty much, you know, 99% of the systems, complex systems where things are working at different time scales, but you still need to make sure that the control scheme is working at the, at the time scale for that particular act actuator. 
So uh, unfortunately, this is not part of your, uh, I mean, some of this stuff is something you will learn when you actually go into the market and you study individual systems. Like when you go on the job, that's when you will need some of this information. Uh, okay. Let me just write it used when subsystems are working at different time scales. Okay. So now the question is how does the Fourier transform change in this case? Uh, well, an easy calculation will show that the Fourier transform for the time expanded signal x k or n is x e raised to j k omega. So the important thing to note is here, the signal is stretched. And in this case, the frequency response is compressed. Not the frequency response, the Fourier transform is compressed. So for any value of K, it would be the same for your transform? Uh, for every value of K. So K is here, right? So uh, what do you mean by it will be the same Fourier transform? So so the K is fixed, right? So the how do you upsample or downsample? That part is fixed. K is fixed. Never mind. I didn't see the K on the right side. Yeah. So let's say this is what your Fourier transform looks like for the original signal. Oh, this is plus pi. And I want to say this would look like this. No, this is wrong. I have to be careful. This is my X e raised to jk omega. So you will see that the frequency, uh, that the Fourier transform is going to look compressed. So you're going to compress the Fourier transform, whereas in the time, time signal domain, you are actually stretching the signal. Uh, there's a nice picture in the book. Uh, I should have copied that picture for our class, but I didn't, so my bad. Uh, but but there are nice pictures in the book that you can look at and understand this concept in a better fashion. Maybe I'll I'll put it up uh, on the website on the Carmen today after the class. Okay. Now let's look at the next property, which is differentiation. in frequency domain. And the idea here is Xn, uh, this is the Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. 
Now, if you take n x n, the Fourier transform would be So if I take the frequency, uh, uh, I look at the Fourier transform, take the derivative with respect to the frequency omega, multiply it by j, I get the Fourier transform of n times x of n. The proof is fairly straightforward. Let's look at an application of this. So let's say my signal Xn is one over one minus, well, sorry, A raised to N, U of N, absolute value of A is less than one. And the Fourier transform is X let's consider y e raised to j omega And the question we have is, what is y of n? So what do you notice between this capital X of e raised to j omega and capital Y of e raised to j omega? They're the same thing, except the, the for the y of n at the bottom of the, uh, division is uh, squared. Yeah, so that's right, that's right. So so what do you think? How can I how can I get y from x? Uh, let me be a bit more specific. So what happens when I take the derivative of x with respect to omega? Let's let's do that. What I'm what I'm going to claim is if I take the derivative with derivative of capital x with respect to omega I'm going to get something that looks like y. That looks like y, it won't exactly be equal to y, but it looks like y. So let's let's do it. One over one minus a e raised to j omega. Okay, now who wants to help me compute this derivative? So whenever I see a derivative of, uh, you know, some fx over gx, then the first thing we would like to do is square the denominator. And then what do we do? Let me let me write down d over dx fx over gx is equal to gx square gx f prime x minus uh, g prime x fx. 
right? All of you probably remember this this formula from your calculus class. So we need to do the same thing here. I'm taking the derivative with respect to omega. So the first term will be gx, which is one minus a times zero, because the derivative of one is equal to zero minus g prime of x. So what's the derivative of this? It's minus a j e raised to j omega times fx, which is equal to one. Okay. So this is equal to a j e raised to j omega over one minus a e raised to j omega square. Oh, I think I made a mistake. There should be a negative minus j omega here. minus j omega. Okay, so then I have, so what do I have? Y of e raised to j omega is equal to j times d over d omega x e raised to j omega multiplied by one over a e raised to j omega. Oh, I have to have negative here, negative here, negative here. So let me write it as one over e raised to j omega and then j d over d omega x e raised to j omega. Okay, so now I see that the derivative is being used, but now we have e raised to j omega multiplied, and then I have divided by a. What do you think should the y of n be? I hope everything is clear so far. Any questions so far with this computation? I think it's a fairly straightforward computation. 
Uh, I want you to check your equation. So there is e raised to negative g omega all over the place, which I had missed earlier. So e raised to minus g omega, e raised to minus g omega uh, here. So wherever you see e raised to g omega, it should be actually e raised to minus g omega in the expression. Okay, now how do we proceed from here? Plug in the derivative we just calculated of right. x. Right, right. So this would be the inverse Fourier transform of this part. Let me call it y1 of n. This would be n a raised to n u of n. Okay, but now I have e raised to j omega over a sitting here. So when does the Fourier transform gets multiplied by e raised to j omega? Let's go back to our lecture 20 and let's look at time shifting. So when you have X of N minus N naught, then the Fourier transform is multiplied by E raised to negative J omega N naught. Okay, all of you remember this expression? Let's try to use it. So here I have e raised to j omega, which means that for this whole thing, my Fourier transform would be y1 of n plus one, which is equal to n plus one a raised to n plus one u of n plus one. Right, but 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 I have I have not taken into account this one over a term. So let me just write one over a over a. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So which means that my y of n is going to be n plus one a raised to n u of n plus one. What happens at n equals to minus one? What's the value of y of n? Zero zero, right? Because you have an n plus one factor here. So minus one plus one will be zero. Now for n equals to zero, one and so on, it will be n plus one a raised to n. That's it, right? Because u of uh, zero plus one is equal to one and so on and so forth, right? So it's just equal to times one. Let me just write it that way. So then I can write my y of n in a more processed form as n plus one a raised to n u of n. Okay, so after a series of uh, computation, we arrived at the inverse Fourier transform of this term, y of any question. Should that be squared on the bottom? Oh yeah, of course, of course, thank you. Okay, our next 
topic is Parseval's identity. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Could you could you go back? What needs to be squared on the bottom? This uh, the y of e raised to j omega is one one over one minus a e raised to minus j omega square. So this is the okay, square, thank you. square term that was missing. So I added it. Parseval's relation. Parseval's relation. So Parseval's relation tells you the relationship between the energy in the signal, the total energy in the signal and the uh, uh, energy density, integration of energy density of the Fourier transform. So, so this is basically saying the total energy in the signal which is absolute value of x n square summation n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity is actually the integral of the Fourier transform square over any two pi interval. So you can take the integral from minus pi to pi or from zero to two pi, it doesn't matter. Any two pi interval uh, you can pick a interval of length two pi and you can integrate the Fourier transform square, you get the energy in the signal. This Fourier transform square is called energy density spectrum. of Xn. We have done this several times. It's There's no new news here. You've seen this probably five times by now in this class. This is the total energy. So total energy is integral of energy density. Let's move on to the next property, which is the famous convolution property. So I have Y of N is equal to X of N composition sorry, convolution H of N. The convolution in time domain is, convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain. So the Fourier transform just gets multiplied. I have an LTI system. I give it an input X of N and it turns out if the impulse response of the LTI system is H of N, you can just multiply the Fourier transform of the input signal with the impulse, the Fourier transform of the impulse response or the frequency response of the signal. And you get the, the Fourier transform of the output. Remember, this is the frequency response. By definition, the frequency response is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. 
So all of this is connected. The impulse response, the frequency response, the Fourier transform, all of this is connected. So that's where, so we are slowly building that mathematical machinery so that you can understand how LTI systems behave. Okay, now you have uh, LTI systems in cascade. X sub N gets H1 of N, then it goes into some other system, H2 of N, then it comes out as Y of N. Turns out Y of E raised to J omega will be equal to X H1 e raised to j omega, H2 e raised to j omega. Just multiply all the frequency responses of the system multiplied by the Fourier transform of the input. You get the Fourier transform of the output. And that's because Y of N is equal to X of N convolution, H1 of N convolution, H2 of N. So if it was 1790 and you were looking into these LTI system equations in 1790, 80, um, you will have to actually do the convolution in order to compute the output. However, if it was 1850, by which uh, Fourier had already come up with the Fourier transform idea, and it had percolated into the systems theory literature, if somebody had asked you to compute Y of N, it was easy because you could just take the Fourier transform of individual signals, multiply them, do the partial fraction, do the inverse Fourier transform and you get the value of Y and pretty easily. And if you make a mistake somewhere in between, it's extremely easy to debug and uh, correct your mistake. Okay. I can't stress enough how beautiful this equation is that uh, Convolution in time domain is multiplication in frequency domain. It has had a huge impact in the field of control, signal processing, networking, and so on. Okay, let's move on to the next property, which is the multiplication property. Any question on the convolution part before I move on to the multiplication? Okay. I have two signals, X1N times X2N. And the Fourier transform of the multiplication of two signals is the convolution, one over two pi integral over any two pi interval, x1 e raised to j theta, x2 So multiplication in time domain is periodic convolution in frequency domain. Okay, periodic because you have to integrate over any two pi interval because X, X1 and X2, they both are periodic functions of omega.
Okay, so if it was a continuous time signal, uh, we had studied that in the multiplication property, the the multiplication in time domain is the usual convolution in frequency domain. That's for the continuous time signal. Uh, in the discrete time signal, the property is slightly different. So multiplication in time domain is periodic convolution, periodic convolution in frequency domain. Okay, and this periodic, the word periodic comes because you are taking the integral of, for any interval of length two pi, because this signal x1 and x2, they are periodic signals. Okay. So that's the multiplication property. Uh, for duality, I'm, I'm not going to go over duality property. Um, in fact, uh, there is no duality in the, for the aperiodic signal case, uh, but for the periodic signal case, there is some duality property. And, uh, and so I'll just put up some material for you to read offline. Uh, it's not part of, I mean, I won't make it part of the syllabus for this class but it's just a good mathematical uh, property of Fourier transform that may come handy in some of the future courses you may take. Okay, so not I'm not gonna cover duality uh, in today's class. Now let's look at one possible type of LTI system, which is linear constant coefficient difference equation. Going back to lecture five and six. Linear constant coefficient difference equation. So here the input output relationship is given in this form. So summation a k y n minus k k equals zero to n is equal to So a k and b k they are constant. They don't depend on n. They only depend on k. They are constant, and it's a linear difference equation. Okay, so it's it's linear in y and it's linear in x. The equation is linear in y and linear in x. That's why it's called linear constant coefficient difference equation. Let's try to compute the frequency response of this system which is given by h e raised to j omega, which is y over x. This is what I want to compute. What do you think we should do? Uh, when we take the um, the Fourier transforms of our uh, input and output and then just divide right. the two? Yeah. So let's take the Fourier transform of this equation on both the sides, okay? And we'll, we'll collect all the terms together to compute h of e raised to j omega. This is exactly what we did also for the continuous time. 
and we are just imitating the same step in the discrete time case. Okay. So I have AK. What's the Fourier transform of Y of N minus K? K equals zero to N, K equals zero to M. So we have looked at time shifting property of Fourier transform. Let's, let's go back to lecture 20 and look at it. Time shifting, okay. So here is X of N minus N naught, the Fourier transform is E raised to minus J omega N naught, X of E raised to J omega, perfect. So we have the formula, let's apply it. So y of n minus k, this is e raised to minus j k omega y of e raised to j omega. Same thing here, this is minus e raised to j k omega x of e raised to j omega. So this implies I want to find H of E raised to J omega, the frequency response of the system. Now I recognize that this term doesn't depend on K, this term doesn't depend on K. So I can take it outside the summation. And what I get is Y Now our life becomes easy. I have H is equal to Y over X, which is equal to Here K goes from zero to N and here K goes from zero to M. So this tells me what the frequency response of the system is, what H e raised to J omega is, which is the Fourier transform of the impulse response of the system. And starting from the difference equation, getting the value of H or getting the expression for H is actually fairly simple and straightforward.
Any questions so far before we proceed to an example? Okay. Let's look at an example and that will end the class. So y of n minus three over four y of n minus one This is my difference equation. Constant coefficient, uh, linear difference equation. Now using the expression in the previous page, what is the h of e raised to j omega? Can someone tell me? What is it equal to? Who wants to give it a shot? What capital Y e raised to j omega or capital X e raised to j omega? Well, you know, I just want the expression, the the fractional expression. I want this term. I want this term, not this one. This one is obvious. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wrote the two above. So what's the de what's in the denominator? All right, uh, one minus three fourths e to the negative j omega plus one eighth e to the negative two j omega. Perfect. Thank you, Bernard. So this is h of e raised to j omega. Um, I want to compute the h of n. And turns out that this should be the inverse Fourier transform of H of e raised to j omega. So by the way, we have figured out how to compute the impulse response of such a system, which was using the principle of mathematical induction. And this is something you did in, we did in, I think lecture seven or eight. So this is the second method of computing, or rather I should say the third method of computing the impulse response for this system. So how do we go about computing the inverse Fourier transform? It, 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 this seems like a very complicated h of e raised to j omega. And so the answer would be, can someone guess what the answer is? Partial fractions. Partial fraction, perfect. Okay, so let's do partial fraction. I will first, the first step is to factorize the denominator. And so I can factorize it. I'm just going to write the expression. You can check that this is correct. Later on, so this is how I'm going to um, factorize the denominator, and then I'm going to call it A over one minus one half E raised to minus J omega plus B over one minus one over four E raised to minus J omega. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to derive the values of A and B. So, but after a simple computation, A equals to four, B equals to minus two. And we get, we can put in the appropriate value of um, A and B there. And then I get H of N which is the inverse Fourier transform, four one half raised to n u of n minus two one fourth raised to n u of n. 
And so I have calculated the impulse response of the system using partial traction. Okay, with this, uh, the I end the lecture. I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to stay back if you have any questions.